This is the University Religious Forum. It's a, a lecture series that we have sponsored uh, for longer than the 21 years that I've been here at IPFW. We try to find topics of interest to not only the campus, but the community that have some sort of uh, spiritual component um, or a historical spiritual component, and we checked both boxes today. So I'm delighted um, to introduce Irv Adler. I met Irv actually uh, through the mediation of Dr. Stephen Carr from the communications department who sent me an email and said, you really should meet this man and hear his story and maybe we could see about providing a venue on campus where he could share his story. So I was very happy to do that and I met with uh, Irv at Starbucks on Coliseum a few months ago and uh, it is a fascinating story. And as he told it to me, I immediately thought, yes, we need to get him on campus so our students can hear about this. Uh, of course, not only is he talking about uh, the larger um, uh, horror of the Holocaust, but what makes this story most compelling is that he's introducing the personal aspect of it in terms of his search to find uh, what happened with his family in particular um, in, in the midst of the horror. So it's, it's an interesting stand, uh, story from that standpoint as well because you're going to hear about the search that was uh, involved and, and, and uh, really how that opened up um, a, a whole story about his family and his life that he really didn't know about for a, a long time. So... Um, Irv uh, taught for a year here, I uh, learned, uh, as a, was it an adjunct, were you adjunct? adjunct. Yeah, adjunct professor, B business department, but um, he was in engineering most of his life, um, but the most important thing you need to know is that he got an undergraduate, or got a graduate degree from the University of Michigan, and all of us who are big fans of University of Michigan and say go blue, um, are really proud of, of that degree. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I don't, uh, I don't want to take any more of his time because I, I said this is a fascinating story. So without uh, any further delay, let me introduce you to Mr. Irv Adler. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. By the way, can everybody hear me back there? Okay, because I prefer not to use a mic. All right. Well, good afternoon. It's nice to see everybody sitting here eating their pizza or haven't eaten their pizza or whatever. I'll have my pizza afterwards. So I'd like to thank you all for taking the time this afternoon to hear how I discovered and then connected with my Viennese family, uh, given by me, a local historian. I have now become a local historian just overnight, which was kind of nice. Uh, so. The, the talk that I'm going to give is going to focus on research that I've done on letters that, that came from my grandmother to my mother. And through these letters, I found family members that I, that I never knew existed. So what I'm going to present today is part of a larger project involving these letters. And I'll talk about that during this presentation. So now come see. Let me do this in the right direction. OK. So before I start my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who have helped me on this project. Dr. Elizabeth Klamper, who is the archivist for the Documentation Center of Western Resistance, and she's helped me a great deal find information on the whole cost of Vienna and on what happened to some of my relatives and helped me find others. Joy Gieschen, who, when she was working on this project, was a student for a master's degree in education at IPFW and she translated and carried out research on about a third of the letters, which was done as part of her master's project. And without the work that Joy did, uh, we still would be in the dark about my Viennese relatives. Dr. Elizabeth Betsy Anthony, program manager for the International Tracing Service at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. And you'll see as I go through this presentation how Betsy's work with myself, how we work together, and how that resulted in finding the Spielman family. Marianne Salinger and Michael Simonson of the Leo Beck Institute in New York City, 
and they helped me get the first two-thirds of the letters translated, and I'll be talking about that. Um, those letters were written in this uh, very ornate penmanship called Korenschrift, and I'll show you what that looks like, and I'll also talk about that. Carol Jackson, who's sitting up in front here, a longtime Fort Wayne resident, and I like to call her und, und eine Liebehaberin der deutschen Sprache, uh, somebody who loves the German language, like a Francophile, but the German version, um, who has become very personally involved in the project and has taken upon herself to learn Korenschrift. And I can tell you that was not an easy thing to do, and you'll see why in a few minutes. Uh, Carol's translations of my grandmother's letters have provided a deeper understanding of what my grandmother wrote. Uh, this past May, Carol accompanied Fran and me to a trip to Vienna and also to Minsk, Molly Trutzenitz, and I'll, and I'll talk about that also. Professor Sue Inn Roberts, you might know her, some of you might know her, she's at IPFW, and she has worked with me to improve my German translation skills so, that I, so now that I can read and I can translate my grandmother's letters as well as reading a lot of other uh, important research documents that I needed to go through to be able to understand uh, what was in the letters. My wife Fran, also sitting in front, who has been incredibly supportive of the project and whose involvement as a writer and editor will increase as we explore options to write a book based on the letters which basically <coughs> describe a Jewish person's life under na Nazi occupation. And I'd also like to thank special thanks to ben, ben, Benton Gates, Ben Gates, and also the IPFW Campus Ministry Student Group for giving me the opportunity to speak to you uh, and talk about how I found my family um, as we go through it this afternoon. So now on to my story. So here is a map of the 23 districts that existed in Vienna. Let's get this right here. In 1938, my grandmother lived in the Hitzing district, which is the 13th district. Um, she later was um, moved, and I'll talk about that, in August 1941 to uh, Leopoldstadt. Uh, and Leopoldstadt is where about 40% of the Viennese Jewish population lived. I also want to mention the first district, the Innerstadt. And that's where the Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, or the IKG, or the Jewish community, that's where they were located. And another area in the city which also had a very high concentration of Jews was Alzagrun. So I just wanted to give you a sense of, of, of what Vienna looked like in terms of these districts, because it's quite important. So my mother Elsa, this is my mother Elsa, this is my grandmother Clara. My mother Elsa and my grandmother Clara Bada Nichten lived together for 17 years in their apartment at 117 Hütteldorfer Strasse. And this building, this is how it looked in 19, I believe 1934, and basically it looks that way today pretty much, although the bottom has changed a bit, uh, and we were there recently. So my grandmother and my mother lived together in this apartment for 17 years. And so all, those, all the period of those years, they developed a very, very, very close relationship. So, and I don't know if you've ever seen a Deutsches Reisepass, a Nazi Reisepass, but, but here, here's one, in case you've never seen one. On September 12, 1938, her 27th birthday, my mother left Vienna to take a position as a domestic in an English household. Now, working as a domestic in England was a means of escaping the violent an anti-Semitic persecution that began the day of the Anschluss, the day the Nazis indexed Austria, which was March 12, 1938. During 1938 to 1939, about 9,000 Austrian women fled England to work as domestics. Among them were my mother and other family relatives. When my mother left Vienna, she had every intention of getting her mother out of Vienna. When my mother said goodbye to her mother, my grandmother, it was the last time they would ever see each other again. For anyone who's seen the movie, Woman in Gold, pretty popular mover, movie, uh, you might have a feeling for what this departure might have been like. It's a scene when Maria Altman says goodbye to her parents. 
From the time that my mother left Vienna until just before the U.S. entered World War II, which was at the end of 1941, my mother and my grandmother corresponded by letters. So these letters had names of people I had never heard of, and I'll be talking about that in a few minutes. And this is a small excerpt from one of the letters. It describes a sweet Pauli, the Zusa Paul. Okay, and in this, this Saturday afternoon, I was at Benno's house. He just came home from work at 5.30. He works in Asbang. He greets you many times, as well as Mrs. Heckish, Gisha, Aunt Peppy, and Sweet Pauli. And this is just a few of the names. He sends you 100 kisses. He's such a big boy now. He is learning violin. Now, remember that. This was, he, he's, you know, seven years old. He's learning violin, and he can play, already play a little. He is also interested in soccer, and that was translated by Joy Gieschen. So in a few minutes, I'm going to talk more about the letters and how the letters helped me identify family members I never knew and how, through working with Dr. Anthony at the Holocaust Museum and some flat-out serendipity, I was able to find Sweet Pauli. But before I continue, even though Ben has said a few things about me, I'm just going to give you a little rundown take a little bit of time, a few minutes, so you know who I am. So I was born in New York City, grew up with my family, an extended family in New York City's Upper West Side. And as I grew up, I came to realize that my entire family was from Vienna. I knew my paternal relatives and my, and my maternal grandfather well. I knew very little about my maternal grandmother and virtually nothing about any other relatives on my maternal grandmother's side of my family. At some point, I learned my maternal grandmother never got out of Europe and was murdered by the Nazis. I knew very little else. Every time I had a conversation with my mother about her mother, the conversation was very short as my mother would become very emotionally distraught and couldn't talk about anything. I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, then to New York University, then to the University of Michigan for graduate studies, and Ben mentioned that. My first job was with a Michigan-based Tier 1 automotive parts manufacturer located in Romulus, Michigan, for those who are familiar with Romulus, Michigan. I arrived in Fort Wayne as a result of a move from Michigan to Indiana to take a position as a technical executive with Essex Group. No longer exists. It's now part of uh, Superior Essex. It's on uh, Taylor, which is now part of LS Cable, a Korean company. And I've been living in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and have been a member of Congregation Akhtuk for Shalom for the past 30 years. So, in August 2010, while I was still employed, Fran and I took a much needed vacation to Europe. We visited Prague, Budapest, and Vienna. And Vienna was the last stop. We got to Vienna late afternoon on Sunday, August the 8th, we decided to take a walk to see the Holocaust Memorial at Judenplatz, which is part of the historic Jewish section of the Innerstadt. By the way, that's the reason rod. That's the first Ferris wheel ever, and that's in a park outside of the major part of the city of Vienna, built in the late 1800s. The Memorial at Judenplatz is dedicated to 66,000 Viennese Jews who were killed during the Holocaust. After a short time looking at this very stark monument, we spotted a small museum tucked in the corner of Judenplatz. We went into the museum and I started to talk with the woman who was sitting behind the desk and mentioned that I wanted to get some more information on my Viennese grandmother who died during the Holocaust. She said, you need to go to the Dove, the documentation center of the Austrian resistance. So, Nine o'clock, Monday morning, we showed up at the Dove, where we met Dr. Elizabeth Clampo, who you can see here, it's shown on the side here, the Dove archivist. I told Dr. Clampo that we wanted to get some information about my Viennese grandmother who died during the Holocaust. After about 15 minutes of searching through several databases, Dr. Clampo raised her head from behind the computer monitor. Her face was ashen. She said, 
I have some very bad news to tell you. Your grandmother was killed at Molly Trutzenitz. I had no idea what she was talking about. I had never heard of Molly Trutzenitz, and I suspect that not too many people in this room have ever heard of it either, but you're going to hear about it in a few minutes. <clears throat> Dr. Klampa went on to tell us that Molly Trutzenitz was an extermination camp outside of Minsk. We found out that my grandmother no longer lived at the Hutteldorf address, but had been moved to a Zammelwohnung, a collection apartment in another part of Vienna before she was deported. My grandmother was deported from Vienna on June the 9th, 1942. After changing trains and traveling 1,320 kilometers, she arrived five days later at Mali Trutzenitz. We found out that once the train carrying 1,000 persons in cattle cars arrived at Mali Trutzenitz, the deportees were either dead on arrival or they were murdered within one hour of arrival either by gassing in a portable gas van or being shot and dumped into a ditch. I now know quite a bit more about Molly Trutzenitz, the largest single murder site for the Jews of Vienna. There are about 10,000 Viennese Jews among the more than 400,000 people murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators at Molly Trutzenitz, a huge number. The reason that Molly Trotsinitz is not so well known is that the Nazis destroyed the death camps as well as other similar death camps as they retreated from the Eastern Front. This past May, Fran, Carol, and I were at the killing fields of Molly Trotsinitz with a group of 21 people, including a rabbi and a cantor. We conducted the funeral service for 61 people murdered at Molly Trotsinitz. I gave a eulogy for my grandmother, and in lieu of a permanent monument to the 10,000, we attached yellow plaques to trees, which you can see over here, to symbolically represent unknown graves for my grandmother and for 60 victims that we memorialized that day. Sadly, I now know more about Molly Trutzenitz and what happened to my grandmother, but now, Let's get back to Vienna and my journey to find my family. So what turned out, so what began as a five-day vacation in Vienna turned out to be an extensive research project. Fran and I spent half our time researching family records at the IKG, as I mentioned for the Israelitish, Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, of the Jewish community, and at the archives of the city of Vienna to find out everything that we could about my mother's side of my family. When we were at the IKG, I found the original birth records of my mother and my father, and this is a photograph that I took of these original birth records. These are very old documents. These detailed records of births, deaths, marriages, burials, etc., were kept by the various religious communities in Vienna, in this case, the Jewish community, the IKG. So this is a photo of the original birth records of my mother. The record is very detailed. You can see there's all kinds of writings in here. Uh, it listed names of her parents and other relatives and witnesses. These records proved to be an invaluable source of information as I tried to make sense of the names of my grandmother's letters and later to build my family's genealogy. Summing up our Vienna research activities, we left with more questions than answers. So as I mentioned before, I never got much information from my mother about her side of the family, except on one occasion. In 1974, my parents left New York City and moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. After my father passed away in 1996, my mother moved to an independent living facility, which involved a big clean-out of years and years of saved papers, some meaningful and some not. During the move, I came across a leather-bound suitcase that, it could have, that could have been a prop from the set of the 1942 movie Casablanca. That's how kind of what's it look like. The suitcase contained items such as, and I hope some of you remember Casablanca, or if you haven't, you should see it. Okay. The suitcase contained items such as Austrian pension receipts, passports, citizenship papers, some photo albums, birth certificates, documents related to grandparents who died in the U.S., and 
what look like a small, tightly wound pack of papers in an old, yellowish, crummy-looking plastic pouch with a zipper on top, if you can kind of imagine that. Visiting my mother about a year later, I told her that we needed to go through the suitcase so that I could know more about the documents inside. We sat down and pulled out the old photo albums. <clears throat> I don't know why, but my mother was more willing to talk about Vienna, about her mother, and about other family members. My mother mentioned some letters that she had. She showed me the plastic pouch with the bundles of letters. I didn't realize it at the time, but my mother, who was 87, was starting to lose her mental faculties. Maybe that is why she was more willing to talk about her history, her family history, but I'll never know. That was the last conversation about Vienna that I had with my mother. Shortly after, she had a stroke and lost her ability to speak. After the stroke, my mother moved into an assistant living facility and later into a nursing home. I took the suitcase back home with me to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and my mother passed away in 2003. From 1997 to 2010, the suitcase with the crummy looking plastic pouch and other items <laughs> sat in the closet gathering dust, except when I had to open it to find some information related to my parents. After we returned from our 20 trip to Vienna, I remembered the suitcase. I thought it might contain information that could provide some answers to the questions regarding my grandmother. So I retrieved the suitcase from the closet. I removed the crummy looking plastic pouch from the suitcase. I opened the pouch and extracted a bundle of letters that were tied together in a neat package by a faded pink ribbon. The bundle, as I remember it, was roughly the size of a four by six package of index cards. I removed the ribbon and then started to separate the letters from the bundle one by one and very carefully. Some of the letters were damaged, but most were in good shape. Some were written on conventional writing paper. Some were written on what looked like tissue paper, so thin that the paper was virtually transparent and the writing on one side of the letter could be seen through the other side of the letter. Some of the letters were about the size of a standard piece of typing paper, and some of the letters were about twice the size. Most of the letters also had messages written by other family members. Most of the letters were completely covered in writing. In total, there were about 100 letters, actually now it's 105 letters, and they're written from 1938 to 1941. At this point, I didn't quite know what I had, but I knew enough to realize that the letters could represent a diary of my grandmother's life under Nazi occupation. I knew that I had to get them translated, and I also knew that my German, which I hadn't used very much for the past 40 years, was just not going to do it. Finding someone to translate the letters was not easy, and after about 10 months of trying, and because of a contact that Fran had with Dr. Dave Linquist, David Linquist, some of you might know him. He, at that time, he was a professor at IPFW, and as a result of that contract, contact, we were introduced to Joy Gieschen, who was also a student at that time. Uh, Joy had recently returned from a year in Austria and was working towards a master's degree in education at IPFW preparing for career as a German teacher, and right now she is teaching German uh, down in, in the Carmel School District. So after about two months of translating, Joy asked us if she could use the letters as the basis for a master's degree research project. Fantastic. <laughs> you know. Joy immediately noticed the vast difference in penmanship, which you can see here. Okay. Uh, the very flowery, and I basically say impossible, but certainly difficult to read, an archaic Koran shrift, okay, versus the more modern Latin shrift, which is over here. And by the way, I, I, in this book I here, I have some of the, le the letters from 1940, and I have some dividers here, so you can, if you have a chance, you can see what a Koran shrift letter looks like and what a Latin shrift letter looks like. They're separated by these colored uh, binders, so I'll leave them up here if you want to see them later on. Uh, but because of the constraint um, of the project that was, Joy was working on, 
Uh, and basically the difficulty in learning current shrift from scratch, from her would have been from scratch, and we can talk about how we discovered her. We had some interesting discussions with Joy about, why can't you translate this, okay? So well, after several of those discussions, we decided that we needed to focus on the, the letters that were written in, in Latin shrift. And then later on, I was able to get most of the letters that were written in current shrift translated by Marion Salinger, who at that time was about close to a 90-year-old Holocaust survivor uh, at Leo Beck Institute in New York City. But she could read current shrift. And so this took about another two years and was completed in 2014. So there were a few letters and letter fragments that were weren't, trans weren't translated by Mary Ann, and I have been able to translate them myself and certainly be able to read them uh, with the help of Carol sitting up in front, um, who basically has transcribed these letters or parts of the letters and so that I can read them. Uh, Carol, and I'll mention this again, she taught herself how to read current shrift. And Carol also has provided uh, just very valuable insights uh, into the translation of the Wienerisch, which is the, the Viennese version, that's a Viennese dialect, the Viennese version of German. So you might find this interesting. Okay. Here is an example, by the way, this, I have this one here, but it's, in, it's uh, a copy of that in, in the book. So here's an example of one of the Korentrif letters where the paper was so thin, you can see it here, um, where you could see one side of the letter through the other side. And I can tell you that no one wanted to touch this letter, okay, <laughs> except Carol. <laughs> so, so because of Carol's diligence, and transcribing the letter, and you know, this takes quite a bit of perseverance. By th these were in a PDF, so she magnified every letter and every word, and she transcribed the letter. And then, once she transcribed the letter, as it turns out, and I got it, uh, I translated the letter on May 22nd, 2015, exactly 75 years after my grandmother wrote it. And there's a lot of interesting stuff in this letter, I might add. It's <laughs> a lot of interesting stuff in all the letters. Okay. Okay, now it starts getting interesting. From the translations of the 28 letters done by Joy, we discovered the names of more than 100 people who I, who I had never heard of before. I saw their names in the letters, including tantas and uncles, aunts and uncles, on my maternal grandmother's side of my family. There are atlases, badas, lufs, mahalis, and mihai is the Hungarian pronunciation, sokal, spitzes, and spielmans. When I was at the IKG looking at the records of my mother's births, my mother, mother's birth, and the marriage of my maternal grandfather and grandmother, I saw the, the names badas and spielmans. These were the names of the tantas and uncles in the letters. So the mystery was very slowly starting to unravel. But just as in August 2010, when Fran and I were in Vienna, we continued to have more questions than answers. So we determined it was time to return to Vienna to get some more answers. So to prepare for our trip to Vienna, Fran, Joy, and I met with researchers at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. The most important takeaway from that meeting was the suggestion that we meet Betsy Anthony. This is Betsy Anthony, this is Fran, and this is Joy Gieschen, by the way, for those people who don't know her, who, who is a former employee of the U.S. Holocaust Museum, who is living in Vienna with her Viennese husband, who she met at the U.S. Holocaust Museum, by the way, and was pursuing a PhD in Holocaust studies from Clark University, which she received a year ago in May, May 2016. So I cannot begin to describe how important meeting with Betsy Anthony turned out to be, and you'll see this a little more of this as, I, as through this presentation. So during the week of June 4th, 2012, the three of us were in Vienna. We met with Elizabeth Klampa, whose name I mentioned before. She was the archivist at the Dove. We went to the IKG, we met up with Betsy, and we went to the Hülteldorfer Straße apartment house and to the Konradgasse Sammelwohnung. 
and we discovered the Stones of Remembrance, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. We met with Betsy the middle of that week and spent the better part of the day with her. She was very helpful in answering our questions on what life was like for Viennese Jews during Nazi occupation. Then Betsy took us for a tour of the Alzagrund neighborhood, which I pointed out before, which was, had a high concentration of Jews. She showed us several Holocaust Victims Mem Remembrance Project, such as the Key Project, which is over here. And these keys represent apartments that were vacated by deported Jews who never returned. In other words, they were all killed, mur uh, murdered during the Holocaust. And, and these memorial projects, there's several of them that were in the sections of Alzagrund, and as I mentioned before, that's the a very heavy, had a very heavy concentration of Jews. So during 2012, semester at IPFW, Joe was actively looking for a job. And one of the job possibilities was with an international school in Vienna. And Joy made arrangements to go there for a preliminary interview. And St Fran and I, you know, we didn't have a lot to do. So we figured, might as well go along with her. So as we were leaving the school, we mentioned that our main reason for the Vienna trip was to do research on the Letters Project. One of the teachers at the school asked us <clears throat> if we knew anything <clears throat> about the plaques that had been put in the sidewalks of Leopoldstadt, which marked the last known residence of Viennese Holocaust victims. And we, didn't, we never heard of that, so we knew nothing about it. We then went to Leopoldstadt <clears throat> and started searching for the plaques in the sidewalk that marked their vague Derinnerung, the path of remembrance. We found it and I took down some information on the Vague. Each year, I'll tell you a little bit about the Vague. Each year, starting from 2005, brass plaques known as stones have been dedicated at a solemn commemoration event at the last known residence of Holocaust victim. These are very similar to the Stoppelsteiner that you see in Germany, the same, same basic concept. Most of the stones have been installed and dedicated in Leopoldstadt where more than one-third of the Jewish population of Vienna lived and from where most of the 66,000 murdered Viennese Jews were deported. Also starting in 1941 and thereafter, Jews who were living in other districts in Vienna were rounded up and moved and forced to live in collection homes as the first step of the final solution for the Jews of Vienna. From the letters, I learned that my grandmother had moved to one Konradgasse in Leopoldstadt in August 1941. The first time I saw that address in the letters, I didn't, you know, didn't understand its significance, but, but I certainly do now. During the, during the next year, I followed up on their vague and arranged for a plaque, a stone, to be placed at the one Konradgasse Zamlevonung, and the scheduled date for the dedication of that stone was May 2014, and I planned to be there. So, before my May trip to Vienna, I had several conversations and emails with Betsy, who had recently returned to the U.S. Holocaust Museum and assumed the role of program manager for the International Tracing Service. Okay, what I'd like to do now is just take a few minutes and tell you a little about the International Tracing Service because it proved to be absolutely essential in the discovery of the bottom side of my family. So, the first question is what is the International Tracing Service? The Allies anticipated the upcoming European refugee crisis and understood they would need to reconnect families and research the fates of millions. The Allies collected all the documents from the camps, from Nazi offices and other locations that they came across as they liberated Europe. They scooped up all they found, put the documents into one central location, and organized the documents for tracing work. The collection moved eastward as the Allies moved eastward, started by the British Red Cross in London in 1943, and then taken over by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. The collection moved to Versailles, then to Frankfurt, and finally, in 1946, to Bad Arolsen, Germany. So why did it, why so special about Bad, Ar Bad Arolsen? Well, it turns out that Bad Arolsen was not heavily damaged during the war. Its buildings were in decent condition, 
and could be used for offices and document storage, and it had working lines of communication. Also, as you see, Bad Arlson was yeah, centrally located with respect to the four occupation zones. The work is at the UN uh, Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, later known as the ITS, sorted through all the documents that they received to find those valuable for tracing. The documents initially were indexed by name, date of birth, and place of birth. Other documents designated at that time as not valuable for tracing were put into a miscellaneous file and were more or less inaccessible until the last few years when a digitization project was initiated. So here I'll show you some examples of, of some of the documentation uh, that's in the, uh, the ITS database. You can see all these things, you can just read them. Okay, so this is a photograph of the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration conducting tracing research on the Central Name Index, CNI. And in July 1946, the United Nations Rehabilitation Administration, Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, changed its name to the International Refugee Organization. And then in January 1947, it became known as the ITS, the International Tracing Service. <clears throat> now, all the rows in front of the women and all the boxes and files behind them were reference cards. So you can imagine that it was not easy to do a search, to do search the database, because these are all ref reference cards. But in 1998, the ITS began to digitize these uh, central name index cards. So there are about 17 million names of persons in the ITS database. And every time a name appears in a document, a reference card is created. So for an example, if there were seven documents with someone's name on it, there would be seven reference cards. And each reference card is a data point in the database. So I think you can see it's not too difficult to get a million data points, 100 million data points. And the digitization allows for more in-depth and thematic research is what helped me, and you'll see, about, see that in a few minutes. Uh, it's now possible to search by keyword and sort the findings. And work continues to be done to improve the accessibility of the ITS database. I, I know the ITS program managers, they meet almost every quarter to talk about the work they're doing on this. So there are eight copies of, di of a digital archives at these locations here, and, and this is the one in DC, is at UN, US Holocaust Museum in London. It's the Wiener Library, and we've been there. And there's Bad Arlson and a few other places. U Jerusalem at Yad Vashem. And each of these are managed by uh, an ITS program director. So because of the complexity of the ITS database at this point in time, because people have asked me, can I, can I access the ITS database? But it's, it's, it's very complicated, and it's a very sophisticated database that's still under development. So the only people who can access it are trained individuals, and those are basically the program manager. But, if, but it has a vast, of, a vast amount of information, especially for anybody who's interested in trying to find relatives that, that got lost during World War II or Holocaust victims. And if there's any interest, interest in pursuing this, then the person to contact is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Anthony um, at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Okay, so now let's return to how I found my Viennese family. So, of the previous unknown relatives identified in the letters, <coughs> based on the research that I had done so far, I had the most information on Paul Spielman, the little, little Pauli who I, sweet little Pauli who I mentioned early on, and Max Spielman, Paul's uncle. So we decided to focus on them. Prior to Vienna, the Vienna trip, Betsy and I had the email correspondence about Paul and Max Spielman. I'm going to show that in the following slides, a sequence of slides. But you can see some of the questions we're going back and forth that she asked me about to try to get this information. So when I visited Betsy at the Holocaust Museum that April, she did a detailed search of the ITS database. And we found out quite a bit about Paul and Max Spielman. 
But the most important thing we found is that they had survived the camps. We also found that Paul had migrated to Israel on his own at age 14 because his parents had been killed in the camps. In addition, my mother had a collection of address books dating back to the 1950s. I periodically would go through these address books to see if I can find a link between the names in the books and the names in the letters. And it turns out that Max Spielman's name appeared in several of these address books. And he was living in Sydney, Australia, at least through the mid-1980s. So this is the series of email correspondence I had with Betsy starting in March 2014. Uh, she asked me a bunch of questions. She found some information. Voila. She finds more information about Max, she, and she finds out that he made it through the camps. Uh, then she finds out about Paul, and Paul is alive. He survived the camps. And then, of course, they say it's great. You know, they found Paul and they found Max. And, and these are examples of the ITS cards. And the one in the middle is kind of interesting. So for each, for each, for Max and for, and for Paul, Betsy was able to find about six, seven, or eight cards. <coughs> I have them. Um, and this is the one that talks about Max Spielman, and uh, basically you can see he, Trajanstadt, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, uh, and then eventually he goes to Degendorf, which is a, a, a kind of a, a, a camp, uh, uh, I forgot what it's called, it's a, it, a, camp, it's a, a camp prior to uh, 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 yeah, Displaced Persons Camp, right, thank you. And then he goes to uh, Sydney, Australia. Thank you. Good, always good to have help from the audience. It's good, it's good audience participation. Ben, give these people credit. Okay, and, and this is the card for Paul Spielman. This is one of the cards for Paul Spielman. It sounds, basically shows something similar, but the bottom, thing, but the bottom line here is he, he, gets on a, he gets on a ship in Italy and, and he winds up going to Israel. Okay. Oh, this is Yad Vashem. Then I also researched the database in Yad Vashem, which is uh, Israel's memorial to the victims of the Holocaust, and I found uh, a 1999 page of testimony that was given by a Shaul Spielman, someplace down here, um, and I uh, really wasn't sure who Shaul was, but I noticed that Benno Spielman and Josephine Spielman were names of Paul Spielman's mother and father that were in the letters. So although I wasn't certain that Shaul and Paul were the same person, you know, I was somewhat, you know, it was a reasonable assumption that it could be. And if it was, then I knew that at least in 1999, because this is when this page of testimony was given, Shaul was alive. Okay. So after getting this additional information, don't forget this happened in the month of March and April in, in 2014, I was ready to go back to Vienna for the Stones of Remembrance dedication. And the location on this map, these are the stones that were dedicated on the 18th of May 2014. And this one here, you can see there were a lot of stones dedicated, okay? uh, was for my grandmother. And this is Leopoldstadt, and this is one Conrad Gassel one. Okay, so May, there I am, okay, with my mic here. Uh, May 18th, 2014 was a cold and damp day in Vienna. It had rained all morning. There were about 100 people in their raincoats gathered at the dedication opening ceremony, standing and sitting with umbrellas. They came from all over the world, USA, South America, South Africa, Australia, Canada, and a number of different countries in Europe. The ceremony began at 10 o'clock in the morning, and after about an hour of introductory speeches, we spent a good part of the next 16 hours walking through the streets of Leopoldstadt, making stops at each location where a stone was to be dedica dedicated at one of these stops. And Gershon Gunzberger, who I'm a very important individual, you find out, uh, from Australia, dedicated a stone for his uncle. A little later, I dedicated a stone for my grandmother. So this is the stone that I dedicated to Chaya Nichten, that's her Jewish name. And uh, she was born in 1882, and she was deported to Molly Trutzenitz, and she was killed there. And this main says, and you can read it down here, in this house, 175 people were crammed together in collection apartments before the Nazis deported them, and only 12 of them survived. Um, and the, for those who were deported to Molly Trutzenitz, basically no one survived. So, 
Shortly after my ded dedication, <clears throat> there was a break in the action, and I was aware that Gershon was Australian. I asked him that, that I asked him if he might know how I could get information about Max Spielman. You may remember that Max Spielman emigrated to Australia. So I told Gershon that Max was no longer alive, and I gave Gershon the address that I had for Max. Gershon said he knew exactly where Max lived. It was only a few blocks from where Gershon lives today. Then, we were standing on a damp street in Leopoldstadt waiting for the stone ceremony. Gershon takes out his iPhone and he goes to the link of the Hevra Kedisha, which is the Jewish Burial Society, the Hevra Kedisha in, in Sydney. And within five minutes, he shows me the grave of Max Spielman and his wife, Lily Boma Spielman, and gave me the name of the cemetery in Sydney where they were buried. I had found Max Spielman. Now I needed to find Paul. Was he still alive? So a few days later, after returning to Fort Wayne, I contacted the cemetery and asked, Max, Max, asked if Max Spielman had any living relatives, and if so, could the cemetery contact them on my behalf? So after about a week of email correspondence, I received an email from an Evelyn and Robbie Bomer, two sisters who were the nieces of Lily Bomer Spielman. They were, they were reluctant to tell me very much about Max Spielman. So after another email exchange, which took about a week, uh, the Bomer sisters told me that Max Spielman, uh, basically, I, basically I told them that Max Spielman was my mother's cousin and I was trying to find relatives on the bottom side of my family. And they then got back to me, this is multiple email exchange, they got back to me and they told me that as of 2006, Paul was alive and was living in Israel but that they had lost touch with him. So as of 2006, after 2006, they, they didn't know much about him. But the Bolma sisters did tell me that Paul had, Paul had a son whose name was Benny. He was married, and his wife's name was Katie. And Benny came to the States in 2002, and at least through 2006, was living in Huntington Woods, Michigan, three hours by car from Fort Wayne. So, my next step was to make contact with Benny. From my internet research, I came up with four telephone numbers for Benny Spielman, who was living in the Detroit area. So I made calls. The first three times, zero. I struck out. You know, usually three strikes and you're out, but I had a fourth number. And the fourth number, when I made the fourth number, called the fourth number, woman answered who I later found out was Benny's mother-in-law. I told the woman that I was a relative of Benny Spielman and that I was trying to get in touch with him. I was sure she thought I was scamming her. <laughs> After I gave her information about myself and what I was trying to do, I can tell you she was sort of <laughs> convinced that I knew about the Spielmans and said she would take my number and ask Benny to call me. Two days later, I received a voice message from Benny. The next day, I called him. He answered the phone. I told him who I was and what I was doing. Dead silence. Benny was in shock. The best way I could describe this is if I had just taken a baseball bat and hit him in the head. Okay, once he recovered, <laughs> we had the rest of our conversation, which took a little bit of time. So I told Benny that I was a relative. And until then, the only relative, living relatives of whom he was aware were his immediate family members in Israel. Benny told me that his father, Paul, whose name was now Shaul, was alive and living in Israel. I had found sweet Paulie. And then came... I guess the best way I can describe it, I call this the big wow. So Benny told me that not only was his father alive and well, 
but that his father, his mother, his sister, and her family were going to be in his house in about three weeks, the week of July the 7th. Then on Saturday, July 12, 2014, Fran and I drove to Huntington Woods for a meeting with my, at that time, 83-year-old cousin, who I didn't know was alive a month earlier and who didn't know he had any other family in the world other than his immediate family. And here he is. Oh, back, back up. This is Shaul. This is me. And this is, ben, this is Benny, this is Miriam, his, uh, Shaul's wife. And this is Anat, Benny's sister. And this is Anat's husband, Nior. So you can imagine the meeting was very emotional for everyone. So Fran and I spent all afternoon that evening and the following morning with the Spielmans. Shaul and his wife, uh, Miriam, I pointed out. Benny and his wife, Katie, who's not in this picture, and their children, Anat and her husband, Nior, and their children, and Benny's in-laws. Okay. This is a picture of Shaul at the age of five with his mother, Josephine, and his father, Benno. The last time Shaul saw this picture was when he was a little boy. Both his parents were killed in the camps. I showed Shaul, Shaul this picture and then sent it to him. Benny has told me that his father looks at this picture every day. Shaul told me that when he first came to Israel in 1945, they changed his name from Paul to Shaul. He told me that he had been involved in every major Israeli conflict. He told me he now lives in Ashkelon with his wife Miriam and has led an interesting and fulfilling life. But until I contacted his son Benny, the only other relatives that he knew had survived the camps were his grandfather, Israel Spielman, who died in 1950, and his uncle, Max Spielman, who died in 1992. And after Shaul entered the camps, he never saw either of them again. As far as he knew, he had no other living relatives with ties to his Viennese roots. I told Shaul about the letters and how, by reading the letters, I discovered the Spielmans. I told him how the ITS researches, research that I did with Betsy helped me eventually find him. So here is what I know about the lost and now family members of my Viennese family, the Botters and their descendants. The bottom line. Of the 41 names in this slide, I only knew the eight people identified in, in white. I had never heard of these other 33 at all. Of the 41 persons identified here, at least nine died in the Holocaust, and there's a few others I'm still trying to trace down. Since my discovery of Shaul, I have also found three more bottle relatives. In October 2015, Fran and I were in Vienna and had a dinner with two cousins, Annie Bettelheim and Lydia Mayer, at the famous Café Lantman, which is near the University of Vienna. And I've been corresponding with another cousin, Annie's brother, Peter Spitz, who lives in Copenhagen, Denmark. But I'll talk about this in a few minutes. So after our visit to Vienna, Fran and I traveled to Israel to see Shaul and his family. And on Saturday, October 17th, we arrived in Tel Aviv, and we went to the home of Shaul's daughter, Enat, where we spent an amazing evening with 26 of the 36 members of Shaul's immediate and extended family. Now remember, Shaul came to Israel in 45. One person, no family. I spent several hours going over the research that I had done to find the battle relatives and how they were related to the Spielmans. You can see all the family members. They were all fascinated by the research. Then we had this wonderful dinner. And I can tell you there was enough delicious food there to feed 100 people at least. And it was just fantastic, the whole thing. <laughs> so we spent Sunday in Shaul with his wife Miriam and their daughter Ayala and son-in-law Moshe. And we visited Kibbutz Yad Mordechai, which was named after the commander of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. 
And on Monday, we went to the Negev ge Desert with Shaul's son Yuval and daughter-in-law Liat. And on Tuesday morning, Shaul took us for a tour of Ashkelon. So as I said, Shaul survived the camps, and he came to Israel at age 14. He fought in every major Israeli conflict, and he created a wonderful life for himself that resulted in the beautiful family, beautiful, wonderful family that, that we met when we were in Israel. And then 70 years later, as a result of my grandmother's letters, Fran and I are now part of this family. But we're not done yet, okay? So when Fran and I were in Australia in March 2016, we spent a wonderful afternoon and evening with Evelyn and Robbie Bomer, the nieces of Max and Lily Spielman. They told us stories about Max and Lily. We visited some of their favorite places, and they gave me Max's last personal possessions to give to Shaul. And I met Shaul again in July 2016 at Benny's house in Huntington Woods. And during our visit to Vienna this past May, I met again with two of my, these two Viennese cousins, uh, Lydia Mayer and Annie Bettelheim. And this is Annie and this is Lydia, and we're at the University of Vienna, as it turns out. Whereas our first meeting was a little circumspect, this meeting was totally different. We had a wonderful conversation. Lydia and Annie said they needed to explore their family histories, something that had been emotionally difficult for them to do. They said they would share information with me, so I expect to be communicating with them on a more regular basis, including struggling to write them emails in German. So now I need to meet up with Peter Spitz. And lastly, just this past September, uh, Fran and I and Carol and her husband Dave drove to Huntington Woods to meet Shaul. Carol's been very involved in this program and, and very involved in projects and you know, become a family member. Um, so we drove together to uh, see the uh, Spielmans uh, in Huntington Woods, Michigan, and met with Shaul and his wife Mary at Benny's home in Huntington Woods. And this is, again, Shaul and Mary and Benny. And they're looking at the, the 1940 letters. Interesting, that's what I have in front of me, comparing and trying to read them. And then we also met with Benny's cousin, uh, who came up from Atlanta. He was kind of encouraged to come up because of Hurricane Irma. He was kind of looking for some place to stay, so he came up to Detroit. And he didn't know about any of this stuff. So you can see Benny is now going over that genealogical chart that I showed before with his cousin. So, you know, our, our extended family just continues to grow. I'm not sure what more lost, than more fa lost family I'll find, but I'll continue to look. Um, but uh, again, thank you very much for taking the time to come here to listen.